Welcome everyone to our presentation about chestnut colored long spurs and winter grassland surveys with Tucson Audubon. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Jenny McFarland. She is our bird conservation biologist um, and she manages our survey program and conducts our bird surveys in the grasslands. So she'll be able to give us um, a lot of great information about how those are going and the trends that we're seeing. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jenny. Hello, thank you, Kirsten. Um, hi, everybody, I'm Jenny and I uh, am on staff here at the Tucson Audubon Society. <clears throat> and one of my main roles is to co-coordinate the Arizona Important Bird Areas Program. So for Arizona, that is co-run, which is by two Audubons, which is pretty unusual actually within the programs within the United States. But the Arizona one is co-run by Tucson Audubon Society. I'm in that role. And then Tice Supply with National Audubon runs um we, we we run it together and ties focuses more sort of on the northern half of the state and i tend to focus more on the southern half but we do run it together and collaborate a lot on this program and the important bird areas program if you've ever been birding in really prominent birding sites and seen those little green and white signs that say important bird area with the little swifts flying um that's because the iba program is totally networked so there's you know state programs within the united states and then there's national programs so there's a, it's a coordinated u.s program and then there's this huge international program that's uh headed up by birdlife international out of the united kingdom and they then coordinate 178 approximately different countries that participate in this program so it is a very large hierarchical program with uh, tons and tons of partners and thousands of important bird areas identified all over the world. And a thing to note about the important bird areas program is to an extent it focuses on habitat, like preserving some of the most important habitats in the world for native birds, but it also largely focuses on species. So there are priority species that sites get identified because they're very important for those you know that list of priority birds so that's going to be important in our discussion of chestnut colored long spurs because they are definitely one of those priority birds all right so let me share my screen okay share screen share sound it's going to be important we're definitely going to have some video and sound to talk to show all right so the Chestnut collared longspur is part of our series that we're doing here at Tucson Audubon Society of uh, sort of profiling priority species for the Arizona Important Bird Areas Program. Now, I really, really like chestnut collared longspurs. I think they're super charismatic, really, really interesting birds. And I was wondering, is any who here has seen chestnut collared longspurs? Anyone here encountered them? If you see some hands, okay. So I have only ever encountered chestnut colored long spurs on their wintering grounds. And we're going to talk about exactly where that is. And I don't have a very long bucket list, but on that pretty short list is to see them on the breeding grounds. So uh, I know we have someone here from Canada. who definitely probably maybe in the, the right neck of the woods, but they're really, really interesting birds. And I do want to take a moment too to thank our partners because this has been such an interesting sort of journey of winter grassland surveys for the Arizona IBA program. And um, the program itself, Arizona IBA, is generously sponsored by the um, Arizona Game and Fish Department. They both financially support us and sort of logistically support us. They're really good partners and help us a lot with um, sort of resources and you know, helping us promote the program and share information about the program as well as financial support. So thank you so much, Arizona Game and Fish. And they do that through their Arizona Bird Conservation Initiative Program. That's this logo with the little uh, painted red start. And we've also had for this particular project doing long spur surveys in the wintering grasslands of Arizona, we've had a lot of help from Sonoran Joint Venture, which is a, a really interesting bird conservation um sort of wing of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. If you're not familiar with the joint ventures, you should check it out. And Sonoran Joint Ventures is a really interesting one. And then Bird Conservancy of the Rockies out of Colorado has been really good partners with us on this, which I will meant that you'll hear their name again. So not to start with a downer, but there's been quite a lot of attention lately, which is great. There's been a lot of attention on the fact that there's been 
a noticeable decline in birds in North America, and I'm sure internationally, but this big study that came out in uh, 2020, which uh, was sort of late 2019 into 2020, which then unfortunately got overshadowed by events that very, you know, we're all aware of that happened a bit later in 2020, um, this the, the 3 billion birds study, which got a lot of press. So these are some charts that were done for like articles in the New York Times and the Washington Post. There was a big push in mainstream media to talk about this study that happened. And it was basically analyzing bird populations over the last 50 years. So they were able to take data that had been collected from 1970 up to sort of 2020 and assess how bird populations were doing. And this is a really major study, a lot of collaborators, a lot of really, you know, uh, huge data sets and very smart statisticians looked at all this data and were able to determine that of actual populations, about 3 billion birds were missing. So we had, of our populations of birds, we were, we had 3 billion fewer in 2020 than we did in 1970. And this, um, map here on the right is showing that that was not even. So the birds that were missing were not evenly distributed across habitat types or across bird type. So the habitat type that was hit the hardest where the most birds were missing was grasslands. So that's this uh, brown bar here at the top showing is up to a 50% decline in populations of the species that are associated with grassland habitat. And then it goes down from there. So boreal forest was also quite high, about 30%. Western forests coming in a little under 30 than tundra generalist. But what's really interesting here in this chart is this bar on the right. So there was a habitat type where there was actually an increase in population of birds associated with a habitat type from 1970 to 2020, and that was wetlands. So what that shows is that all the emphasis on wetland habitat that happened from you know 1970 to current, which was a huge, huge push to to protect and restore and create wetland habitat, had a positive effect. The birds did increase within that habitat type, so that's a real positive thought that we can perhaps now focus like we did with wetlands. And there's been a lot of action in this direction with lots of nonprofits and federal agencies to sort of focus on grasslands in a way that you saw with wetlands in the 80s and the 90s. So we'll, that's a kind of a hopeful note because it does look like that emphasis did help. So this is one of the graphics. They did a lot of splashy graphics for uh, this study since it was really getting a lot of attention. And grassland birds, this sort of a little, you know, three and four Eastern meadowlarks were lost since 1970, 53% population in grassland birds is what that chart showed. And then 720, what that translates to, though, is 720 million grassland birds lost since 1970. So literally a population decrease. So grasslands are in trouble, for sure. So this is now you're seeing this. I'm seeing this a lot in grants and funding opportunities. There's just this huge emphasis on grassland now. And, and there's a very good reason for that, because there's been a lot of decrease in that habitat type, which makes sense why you'd see a decrease in the birds if the habitat is literally being lost, which is what's happening. So these are some statistics from various studies about grassland specifically. So 11% of the tall grass prairie and 24% of the mixed grass prairie, 54% of the short grass prairie that once covered much of the continent remains, but some of it degraded, so which means we've lost big percentages, huge percentages of some of these types. Now, this map here on the right is showing what they mean by these different terms of grassland, because there's various types. So there's California grassland, there's the base step. But the ones that we're going to be talking a lot is the short grass prairie, which is this sort of kind of darkish blue mixed prairie, which is this yellow, and then tall grass prairie. So these are the areas, especially short grass and mixed, is where you find breeding, chestnut colored long spurs. But where, but where we've done our work, Tucson Audubon has done their work, is right down here in this sort of mint green section of Chihuahuan Desert grassland. So much of it occurs in Chihuahua, Mexico, which is why it has that name. But it does come up into uh, sort of extreme West Texas, southern New Mexico, and southeast Arizona. So this Chihuahuan Desert grassland is what we're going to be talking about quite a lot in, in the rest of this uh, conversation. But grassland conversion is one of the main ways that grassland habitat disappears or gets degraded beyond usefulness to many native birds. 
So it continues at a rate of millions of acres per year. A lot of that conversion is agricultural. You know, grasslands make pretty good farmland sometimes. So a lot of them get converted. Uh, and then sometimes it gets converted for vineyards or housing or so a lot of conversion happening of grassland species. Now, what's really interesting is that it's not just chestnut colored long spurs, but species that migrate from the Great Plains. So that would be sort of this whole area of short grass and mixed prairie area from the Great Plains to Mexico's Chihuahuan Desert grassland. So those with long chestnut colored long spurs are right in that category have declined by almost 70% since 1970. So as a group, the birds that move from this region and that, you know, for nesting up in this Northern tier and then wintering down in this Chihuahuan desert grassland have declined by almost 70% since 1970. So those are some pretty not so fun statistics, but so here's a map showing, this is using GIS technology. I did not make this map. This was made by, uh, this came out of a study that was done where they were showing sort of as far as I can tell, the predicted historical occurrence of these different grassland habitat types. And what I find really interesting about this is this previous map shows them as these big blocks of habitat, but that's not exactly accurate. It's kind of like when you look at really detailed eBird maps where you see a big block of range of a bird, but it's actually more specific than that, like more parceled out. And that's exactly what this is showing. So historically, before any conversion was happening, as far as we can tell these different grassland types occurred in these regions. So this this one right here, this mustard colored one is Great Plains mixed grass prairie. So that's going to be mostly where the long spurs would be hanging out for breeding. And then this rust color down here is Chihuahua desert grassland. So it was always pretty spotty is my point. It wasn't ever sort of a continuous thing. It was, you know, a habitat pot, big pockets of Chihuahua desert grassland occurred within those zones. But then this map here on the right is the current status of these different grassland types that are up for consideration as conservation areas. So these are going to be pieces of grassland that are in good shape. Okay. So you can see how much less <laughs> there is. It's a lot less. Um, these patches, they exist of each of the grassland habitat types. And a, a lot of these are, have already been put into conservation status or are moving into conservation status. Cause you know, the memo's out that grassland habitat is in, is in huge peril, but we can see here that it's it's certainly a lot less. So there's been a lot of loss of high quality grassland habitat of all these types. So Burr Conservancy of the Rockies is a really interesting group that's very robust. They have a lot of scientists on staff. They have a lot of you know bird survey crews. They do a lot of work with federal agencies, with federal land managers and universities and all sorts of big studies that happen. And this is some of their information about what they call GPCAs, which are grassland priority conservation areas. So th this is happening across the board of grassland being a huge emphasis. And they have done a huge multi-year international study, literal surveys of wintering grassland birds, or not even wintering, just grassland birds within Chihuahuan desert grassland. So this is their map showing where they worked. So these blue outlines are areas that have been identified as GPCAs, so priority areas of conservation for grassland. And these, I don't know if you can see them, but these little tiny squares are their survey plots. So Bird Conservancy of the Rockies did a really interesting study where they were doing bird surveys in Southeast Arizona, into New Mexico, through parts of extreme West Texas, and then quite a lot in Mexico, because most of Chihuahuan Desert grassland does occur in Mexico. And those areas are vastly sort of underreported if you're looking at eBird data or sort of other studies, you get a lot more uh, blank areas on eBird down in Mexico. So they went and did actual studies. And this is their sort of preliminary data here on the right, really complicated little charts and graphs. But the one that we're interested in here is this of the small squares is this middle top one, which shows chestnut color long spur and they're showing a decline. It's pretty steady. Now they all, except Henslow sparrows, interestingly, but all the others are showing this decline. And they're showing a pretty serious decline from 1970 down to 2010. So I just wanted to just present Burr Conservancy of the Rockies as a group that's doing a lot of work with this. And we've been working with them to try to make our surveying more robust and helpful to them as being a part of their larger data set. So that's why I'm mentioning them right now. But chestnut collar long spurs are an incredibly high priority for the Arizona IBA species. When Tice and I sit down and 
together and assess sort of our priority birds for the coming, you know, next several years of work. Some obviously rise to the top, birds like Mexican spotted owl, which are on the endangered species list, or, you know, yellow-billed cuckoo, which is also on the endangered species list, are obviously high priorities. But chestnut colored longspur, which is not on the endangered species list, is right up there in terms of a priority bird for us. And now I'm going to say something that you hear, at least I hear myself and other wildlife biologists say a lot, which is to the spreadsheet. So I have a really interesting spreadsheet I want to share with you guys, but I got to get out of PowerPoint. Where is my spreadsheet? Okay. I have them all right here. Okay, here we go. I have them in order. Okay. So there's this concept <laughs> called SCS, Species of Greatest Conservation Need. So Arizona Game and Fish has a sort of publication that they do every 10 years that prioritizes sort of their wildlife conservation goals for the next 10 years. They just released their new one. And if you haven't seen it, it's actually really cool. And I'll make sure actually, because I forgot to pull it up. I'll make sure a link gets sent in the follow-up email. But the uh, state wildlife conservation plan that Arizona Game and Fish has done has a really beautiful website. They have all these profiles on the different animals that are that they're prioritizing. It's a really cool concept. But one of the things they did that is really important to, to, to me, to the Arizona IBA program is this, I was really waiting for this too, is their new list of SGCN species. And they do this for all taxa, plants, frogs, everything, but the, the bird one specifically. Okay, so here's a spreadsheet showing how Arizona Game and Fish in terms of Arizona-based conservation, which is an important thing for, for our program, how they, the, the, the birds they've identified as the most important. So a tier one is the highest ranking. And that we also kept in here the 2012 ranking. So the one from 10 years ago. So we can see how some birds have maybe increased in priority or decreased in priority. So things, a lot of these number ones make sense. Things like Mexican spotted owl, thick-billed parrot. So birds that are on pretty much on the endangered species list. Now, some of these birds have moved up. So cactus ridges pick me, I went from a two to a one. So birds that are considered a two are sort of that second tier, high, very high priority, but they're not listed on the federal register of endangered species. So birds like American castrel are now in. So they weren't listed 10 years ago, but now Game and Fish has them as a very high priority. And this is all based on sort of data trends that are happening. Anyway, so what's interesting to notice is where chestnut colored longspur stands. So 10 years ago, Game and Fish had them listed as a three, which I think was a huge mistake because they were declining back then, but whatever. So 10 years ago, they were listed as three. Now they've been upgraded to a two, which is the highest by their own rules, which is the highest Game and Fish can give them for a bird that's not listed. So that's pretty high priority, but they're up there with Chihuahua and Raven as the same sort of level. But, but what the Arizona IBA program focuses on is, is, statistics like this or you know rankings like this but also the IUCN so if you're not familiar with the IUCN it's an international ranking of of all types of species they do birds as well I mean they do birds obviously but it's also you know all sorts of things all sorts of critters that they then watch and rank this is international ranking and the Arizona IBA program because the Na international IBA program is very tied into the IUCN they use that a lot for their own sort of priorities, we use it for our priorities. And the IUCN has chestnut colored longspurs listed as vulnerable. That's very, very high in the sort of alarm bells category. There's only like two above that. There's like endangered and then like near extinction. So that's a very high ranking, which is why chestnut colored longspurs are incredibly high on our radar. And if we look down this list, so we, we, we've added to this game and fish list for our, the other rankings that we watch, and IUCN is, is a big one, probably our top one. And they have them listed as vulnerable, which is very appropriate for how they've been declining so rapidly. And tons and tons of other birds that Game and Fish has ranked very high are least concerned, near threatened, which is below vulnerable where they have long spur. The only one other one I could find on my list here is only a few. Pinion jay is vulnerable by the IUCN, which also makes sense. They've been declining dramatically. Um, Sprague's pipit, which has had a huge decline and endangered California black rail. So it's because if you look at this list, if you look at just the game and fish list, longspurs don't pop out that much. If you look at the IUCN list, chestnut colored longspurs really, really stand out. 
And that's my point is, is why they're so high on our priority list, but they're, they're a type of bird that I don't really see birders going nuts about. And part of my goal today is to try to convince everyone here and everyone who watches the recording of this, that chestnut corn longspurs are actually dazzling birds that we should all sort of go look for every winter here in Southern Arizona or on the breeding grounds or on their migration grounds because they're amazing birds. So unfortunately for sort of birder aesthetics reasons, this bird, this photo on the left is what they look like on the breeding grounds. These males, these are both males, both these photos, absolutely stunning birds, right? Black belly, very dramatic, little chestnut collar on the back. But in the winter, this photo on the right, this is a photo taken in Southeast Arizona. This is what they look like in the winter, sort of little brown birds hanging out on, you know, fences and in the grasslands, looking quite a lot like all the other brown birds hanging out. But they're really quite interesting birds. So their breeding grounds are in the Northern Great Plains and the prairies of US and Canada, like we talked about. So this map here on the, the right, this is the, the map from Cornell showing sort of a static map of their, of their range. And the peach colored area is where they nest. The yellow area is where they migrate through and the blue is where they winter. So of course they do come into Southeast Arizona. Now they historically nested at sites that were disturbed by fire or grazed by herbivores. So this is, I mean, we're gonna talk about this too. Longspurs are an ancient line of birds, very ancient group. Um, and they seem to have, they're very sensitive to vegetation structure. They don't like grass that's too high. They don't like shrubs or trees at all, pretty much in their uh, breeding grounds. And we have now found too, you know, in their wintering grounds as well. They don't like grass that's too high. So they tend to be in areas that have been grazed. So in the ancient times, that would have been, you know, Pleistocene, you know, Ice Age herbivores, and then uh, bison later on, and now cattle fill this role in a lot of grasslands in America and in Canada. So yeah, they really don't, will not, areas that have been fenced off where there's no grazing allowed by cattle or, or, you know, they tend to avoid those areas for breeding. They don't really like them. They need short, sparse vegetation. That's really a key component for them. And they do winter primarily in short grass prairie and desert grasslands of the Southern U.S. and Northern Mexico, which we've now defined as Chihuahuan desert grassland. And the species has declined by more than 87% since 1966. So a tremendous downward trend of population and 33% decline within 2003 to 2015. So in recent times, they that, that decline has gotten very steep. Oh, migration map. I can't not do a migration map. If you've seen any of my talks, you've seen these migration maps. So this is a product of eBird. If you haven't seen these, they're amazing. If you go on eBird.org, you can view these for free. They have them for many, many species. And this is an animation map showing, um, play again. So this is where they're wintering. So as the bar moves across, you can see how they've changed in abundance geographically. Hey, stop it. Why are you not playing? There we go. So in the winter, they're down here. And then they in the spring, they surge up. And then in the summer, this is where they will nest. And then they move, migrate again. And in the winter, they come hang out with us here in Southeast Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Mexico. So these are very, very cool maps. And the longspur one's kind of interesting. I love how after the breeding ends, like right about now, they sort of all vanish and they really, really pack into like Colorado, which is a well-known phenomenon. There's areas where people wait for them to come through on migration. But chestnut long longspurs are such interesting birds. They're not sparrows. So they often get lumped with sparrows. And in the past, you'd sort of see them in the field guides near the sparrows, but they are not sparrows. And they and once you spend time with them and see their behavior, it becomes very apparent that they're not sparrows, but they kind of look like sparrows, right? So they're small birds that eat a lot of seed that are mostly brown when we see them here in the wintering grounds. And so I think they get lumped in a lot with sparrows, but their genetics show that they are not. They are in this, the group of the Calcaridae. Okay, that's this, they're the family they're in. And they're actually in the same group as snow buntings. So if you've ever seen snow buntings, which I have not, that's another thing I want to do is see snow buntings. I, I've looked for them, but, but snow buntings, which is this bird here on the right, is very charismatic, you know, kind of well-known for, you know, people visiting Alaska looking for them birds of the windswept, rocky, you know, tundra type birds with little tiny bills and sort of robust bodies, chestnut corn longspur in the same family. 
So now that I, once I knew that and understood that, and I started watching the way longspurs were behaving in the grasslands of Southeast Arizona in the winter, I, I did see some on a wintry, blustery, windy day, a cold day in Southeast Arizona. And watching them was so fun because they were on the ground, pointing into the wind, really crouching low to the ground, acting a lot like I've seen videos of snow buntings acting on, on the tundra, you know, in the wind. So they're very cool birds. They're in this, this really hardy, kind of ancient group, the Calcaridae, which are kind of more, more, their roots go back further than sparrows. They're an ancient group of birds and they're only very distantly related to sparrows. So they superficially look like sparrows and remind us of sparrows, especially the way they flock in the winter, but, but they are not sparrows. They're very much more sort of dynamic and cool than that. Um, and it explained to me a lot how they can survive when I go out and do bird surveys when it's 10 degrees out, you know, in the Sonoida Plains. How do these guys even surviving? It's because they're cousins of the snow bunting. So they're very cool birds. And next time, uh, if you do encounter them down here in the winter or even in the breeding grounds, you could sort of uh, just, just keep that in mind that they're little snow bunting relatives. So a really interesting historical account um, of long spurs has come to my attention. And I do want to talk about that. But first, I want to also showcase long spurs a little bit more so i have some videos lined up and here so i went to ebert and i looked at the map of where people have seen long spurs and then i did that thing you can do that's really fun in ebert where you do um explore rich media and i have some already lined up so this is going to be lists that have um so if you do explore rich media and you zoom in points you can do this for any species points that have um photos or videos will pop up. Oh, gosh, they're freaking supposed to. Ebert's struggling. Okay. So I have some already lined up. So these are some videos of, uh, so this is one from Colorado, and this is a singing long sport. So that's going to be a breeding male. So he's he's on the breeding ground. So this behavior is very different from what we see in Southeast Arizona. And here's an even better singing one. This is also, so this one's from Nebraska, Holt County, Nebraska, from someone's eBird list, from Mark Brogy's eBird list. Oh, play. That's a metal art. Thong bombed him. All right, that's a wonderful video. And what I thought was most striking about this video to me was the bird singing, because I've never heard them sing because I have not visited them on their breeding grounds. But so he does a bit of song and then he does a little dee -dee -dee call at the end of that song fragment, which is the wintering call that we hear. Dee -dee 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 -dee. And then he did it at the end of his song. So let's play that again. He ended with the which is but they do all the time here on the wintering grounds that dip it up part. So I thought that was amazing little, little uh, video there. Now here's some video on the wintering grounds. So here's what, here's what we see. <laughs> so they're, they, they have some of their markings on the face and, you know, they have a little bit, but they're mostly beige, different shades of beige is how we see them, which when you get a good view like this is actually very sort of beautiful in a subtle way, but definitely beige and looking a lot like the other sparrows that are hanging around now their bills are quite small which really stands out but when you see them at a distance you know unless you have a big lens it's it's kind of hard to see that um but here is what we tend to encounter okay so here's a video that i use a lot for training of volunteers when we're going to go out and look for these birds this is a video that um matt griffiths who's on staff here at tucson audubon captured this video in the San Rafael grasslands, which is one of the two areas we primarily survey. So this is out sort of Southeast of Patagonia. This is the San Rafael grasslands. If you have not been there, I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful area. And they fly in flocks. So when we're surveying for them, chestnut color long spurs move through in these big, big flocks. Oh, well, less big now than they used to be in the past when we would do these surveys, but they come through and they often come through in groups and they do this really distinctive call and they do it a lot thank goodness in the winter <laughs> otherwise we never detect them but they do this flocking call and they all will do it and this is what it looks and sounds like 
they go, move them through. So it's a video that shows how they move, which is very, very helpful. And they do this diddly, 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 diddly call. And they do it a lot. Every time they're, they don't do it really so much when they're sitting on the ground, but when they're flying around in groups or when they're coming in to drink, which we'll talk about, it's a really important thing that they, how, how they feel about drinking um, and, and the importance of cattle tanks and ponds, they, they call a lot. All right. So now I want to talk about some of this historical information. So... Chestnut cone and longspurs are declining quite rapidly. And what's really interesting is to go back and look for some historical information about birds like that. I like doing this in general. I love going into sort of old historical accounts of things and uh, of birds especially. And this was a very interesting one that um, I have found. It took me many years actually to track this one down. But it turns out that Wilfred Hudson Osgood, there he is on the on the right, looks like a very pleasant fellow, who was born in 1875 and died in 1947. He was an American zoologist, and he was part of the Cooper Ornithological Club, and he taught at a school in Arizona for a year, and then he moved to the newly formed Stanford. And he, he did get a really interesting career. In 1909, he moved to the Field Museum, which is a very prominent um, zoological museum in Chicago, where he was assistant curator of mammalogy and ornithology from 09 to 21, 1921. So nice long stint doing that. And uh, then was curator of zoology himself, so the top guy for from 1921 to 1940. So really well versed, really knows what he's talking about, guy. And I bring this up for a reason. So while he was working at the Field Museum, he was elected as a member of the London Zoological Society. So I want to find out more about him. He seems like he was a really interesting guy. Had a long career as sort of a absolute authority in ornithology in North America. Now he submitted a short article to the condor which is a top journal of ornithology has been for many years and he was just describing a trip that he took a visit he took to arizona so in 1894 november to june of 1895 so a winter and a full spring into june so he missed the monsoon but he seems like he did everything but the monsoon <laughs> he, he was visiting someone in the sulfur springs valley near wilcox so this is an area you may be familiar with, uh, certainly a prominent birding area in Southeast Arizona now in Cochise County, Arizona. So for seven months, he stayed with basically a rancher living in Sulphur Springs Valley. And I devoted as much time as could be spared from other duties to making a collection of birds of the region. Now, this is a really cool article. And he goes on to describe a list of all the bird species he encountered and his impression of how their numbers were. So he's talking about, okay, green, when he says green winged teal taken at Sulphur Spring, he means he collected one. But then he goes on to talk more, more, um, oh, this, you know, black crowned night heron, I, I collected one specimen, American coot, a large flock was found, um, you know, let's see, has cinnamon teal in here, cinnamon teal, the most common duck about mud holes in the winter, often taken at Sulphur Spring. So he's giving a sense of how abundant he's finding these different species. Now you keep going through his list of birds. It goes on for several pages. But this page towards the end is one that is absolutely fascinating. Okay, so where we're looking is right here. And it says here, Calcareus ornatus, which is chestnut collared longspur. In February and March, the chestnut collared longspur was exceedingly abundant. They were seen flying over at all times. And at nightfall, clouds of them would sweep over the house and on down to the grass at the edge of the alkali lake. So that, that would be the playa. And, um, in the Wilcox area, if you've ever been down there, it's a big sort of water body that collects rain. Whence they straggled out at daybreak. So he is describing chestnut colored longspurs in the wintering grounds of Southeast Arizona. So that's classic Chihuahuan desert grassland down there as literally as clouds. So very, very abundant. And I mean, some of these other birds, he talks about, you know, them being in flocks or, you know, several pairs you know, often seen, no specimens taken. But the only one I saw in this whole article where he described as clouds was chestnut collar. And he talks about the next one is McCown's longspur, now known as thick-billed longspur, found in the company with this preceding species, so often sort of mixed with chestnut collar, but not in quite such large numbers. So this, to me, is fascinating. It's We always knew that they've been declining a lot, but here's someone from, you know, 1895 saying that he was seeing them in literal 
you know, his impression of them as being in clouds, which I have never seen them in such large numbers in the wintering grounds because they have been declining so much. So back to the data, <laughs> which is what we really focus on a lot. So this is a nice map that was done by Burke Conservancy of the Rockies. And this is their sort of results map from their work from 2007 to 2011 of where they had chestnut collar long spurs. So they're giving their data in a visual impression here, where in those years from 2007 to 2011, they were having clusters. So here, this is our region here, Southeast Arizona right here, where they had a pretty big group in what they call the Sonora, the Sonoida uh, Grassland Priority Conservation Area. And then this is the Sulphur Springs one. They had some there too, but most of their big numbers came from sort of the Texas, New Mexico border and then down into Mexico. Now where we've been working, this map here on the right is, is our map, whoops, showing um, some of the important bird areas. So this is an outline of some of the IBAs of this region. And so here's the Huachucas, here's the Patagonias, the Santa Ritas. Now right here is the Las Cienegas National Conservation Area, which is one of the areas we survey. And it is a global important bird area because of chestnut color longspur. And then down here, the um, San Rafael grasslands, which is beautiful. It's right next to the sort of Patagonia Mountains. It's this beautiful grassland valley. And so these are the two areas that we survey in Southeast Arizona. But I just sort of wanted to show how they fit within the larger context of this much larger wintering range of chestnut color long spurs. So the two areas we survey a lot are the San Rafael, and it is mostly private land out there. There is, there is some access, there's two, there's two major roads that go through the valley that the public is welcome to use, and you can sort of pull off onto the side and scope and bird, and it's absolutely gorgeous out there. If you have not been out there, I highly recommend it. Just be very wary, just be uh, you know respectful of no trespassing signs, but, uh, but there's whole sections that don't have them that you can sort of wander onto and see what's going on. And there is some public land as well. There's some forest land on the edges and there's a, um, a relatively new state park down on the South end, but it's a great spot to see chestnut corn long spurs and all other sorts of wintering birds. It's also, it's beautiful there in the summer too. The other major area we survey is Las Cienegas. Now this is mostly public land. This is BLM. So Bureau of Land Management um, manages this area. And there is a matrix of private. There is some private scattered throughout but it's mostly public land oh and another thing that's sting between these two grasslands is um the las cienegas does have quite a lot of layman's love grass so that's an invasive grass that is very poor food for native birds but kind of crowds out natives it's a real problem now there is lots of natives as well in las cienegas which is why we get long spurs but um, the san rafael has whole sections that are pretty much only native grass, but I am seeing layman's in there more and more in, in recent years. But layman's the invasive is poor food, but um, there are whole sections that have lots of natives, which is where the long spurs tend to be, is what our, our research has been indicating based on where we survey and where we find them. So we were doing these surveys for a long time. We started in 2011. This is right after I started working at Tucson Audubon in 2010. And we started doing these surveys, and boy, was it difficult because when we were like, what? we got to we got a monitor for long spurs. They're our, one of our top priority birds. And we went out looking for them. And, you know, when you read about long spurs and you, you study their field marks and then you, you go out there and try to find them, that's not how you find them. It turns out because you can hardly ever see, you know, their tail markings or like the stripes on their face. Cause they just, they move so much. They're very, when they get in these winter flocks, they're real jumpy. They fly around a lot. They, they, and we had to, confer with an expert so the first year we did it we didn't like find any because <laughs> we weren't we were trying to like scope them and see what the field marks were and that's turns out that's not the way you do it so when we conferred with an expert homer hansen was very generously helped us and did a workshop with us on how to find long spurs both for the iba coordinators and um a big cod a big group of volunteers and once we knew the correct approach to try to find them. Suddenly we were finding them on the survey. So a lot of it is their call. You have to listen for their call. And a lot of it's their movements. They fly in these big flocks. So this photo here on the right was taken in Los Cienegas of a group of long spurs coming in. And the way like these four have their wings open or maybe five have their wings open and the rest have their wings totally closed and they're sort of launching <laughs> themselves like little missiles. This is a still shot that shows what Matt's video showed. The fact that the bird's fly in this what's what seems like an irregular pattern makes them sort of fall and pop all over each other like popcorn in an air corn popper now this is 
mo almost certainly a defense mechanism. It makes it difficult for something like a falcon to come through and grab one of them because they're just sort of all over the place. They don't fly like a school of fish the way like a horn larks often will. They do this sort of falling and tumbling motion all over each other. So once we knew to look for things like that, things you can see at a distance, we started finding long spurs better. And then their call is incredibly helpful as well. So it was definitely a learning curve for sure to try to try to find them. But um, once we knew what we were doing, boy, we were finding them a lot better. So we've been working on this for years. It's been definitely a journey and a, and a learning curve and trying to figure out how to do this. So the first few years we did our surveys well, more than a few years for, for most of the last 10, 15 years, we've done these as very much sort of a Christmas bird count style where we had teams, we had routes, we had people traveling through and trying to find long spurs, basically looking for them in likely spots. So, but a few years back when the IUCN red, red list, they were upgraded, just on long spur was upgraded to vulnerable from sort of near vulnerable or near threatened to vulnerable. We needed to do a better sort of more robust survey methods. So we have spent the last several years trying to figure this out. So they're a global IBA bird. We got those two sites, uh, Las Cienegas and San Rafael designated as global IBAs. Now for many years, we've done two surveys per winter in both the Las Cienegas and the San Rafael grasslands. And in 2019, we tried to do, we, we worked to do a lot of improvements on our protocol and really sort of level up and this was done with some help from Burr Conservancy of the Rockies being in discussion with them. And also with a grant we got from Sonoran Joint Venture to enhance and improve and do a training workshop on our new protocol. So we added tank assessments. That has been something that has really jumped out to me as a really key component of um, habitat sort of um, choice for these long spurs. They need to drink. So here, um, this photo showing long spurs coming in as a little group to come to the edge of the water. One of the most reliable ways to see long spurs if you're out there birding in La Cienegas or San Rafael is to go to some of their favorite tanks and just hang out and they'll, they'll eventually show up. It usually takes no more than half an hour to 45 minutes. They'll show up and come in as a group to get a drink. And they do this throughout the day. They do it a lot because they 99% of their diet in the winter is grass seeds. And if you eat a lot of seeds, which is very, very dry food, you need a lot of water in your system to digest those seeds. So they come and they get drinks a lot. They drink a lot throughout the day. So they come and get drinks at the tanks. So this is something that we've zeroed in on, which is actually something Burke Conservancy of the Rockies was, is not doing that we're in conversation with them because it seems like a really good way to know if they're around is to watch the tanks. So this is something that we've been developing is sort of this tank watch idea and tank assessment idea. We also added a grasses component. So trying to keep track of when we see long spurs, do a grass assessment, real rough assessment. Okay, are there invasive grasses around? What percentage of the grasses are layman's love grass around you? And are there natives around? So that's been really interesting trying to tie where we've seen long spurs to where there's layman's or in a team, not always, interestingly, not always, but often it's a very low percentage, you know, zero to 20% layman's and a lot of abundant native grasses around is where you tend to find them. We also added transects, which was a big change for us on these surveys. So this was made possible by Sonoran Joint Venture and in partnership with Burke Conservancy of the Rockies, who's been really great about helping us try to understand this. And we're working together collaboratively because some of what we're finding may help them with their surveys because no one has found a good way to survey for winter Wintering chestnut collared long spurs. They're very flockish. They're very hard to track. And Burke and of the Rockies has really been struggling with this. And I mean, so have we to an extent, but with those broad spectrum surveys they were doing, they were really struggling with this. So we added sound recorders, which I'll talk about in a moment, and tank assessments and um, this grassland species assessment, as well as traveling transects. So those are these 200 meter long transects that we walk, and I have a map of those. And then we did a training workshop in 2019. So this was all made possible from a grant we got from Sonora Joint Venture. And I really appreciate it. So what these two photos are showing is a, uh, a tank. This is one of their favorite tanks they like to come into. Notice the complete lack of trees or shrubs anywhere near this tank. That seems to be a big feature for them. They like tanks that are very open like this without any trees or shrubs around them. And then this photo here is some of their favorite grasses. Mm, this is their favorite food. <laughs> This is um, going to be those native grandma grasses that you see have that distinctive sort of curly 
um, eyelash kind of look that you see, like clearly almost like false lashes or something um, in the wintering. When they curl over in the winter, that's what they look like. So this is, if you see a lot of this around and a nice tank, that might be a good spot for wintering long spurs. So our sound recorders component has been really interesting. We added sound recorders into the mix um, starting, I think, four or five years ago, where this green device here attached to this tree, and this is a tank they like as well. There's a few tiny trees around it, but not a lot. So this is a tank in Los Angeles that they really favor. And we put up some sound recorders, which are electronic automated devices that you can program to then record ambient sound um, throughout whatever hours you program it. So I told these to record basically all day. So they were starting at dawn and then going till dusk and they just sit there and listen. And they don't, it's not like a bat recorder where they're triggered by hearing bat sounds because birds call sort of in the regular auditory spectrum. There's nothing really to trigger it. So the, these recorders are designed when they're for birds to just listen for whatever hours you tell it to. And they just record audio. And because long spurs come into these tanks frequently and because they call a lot and they do when they're in these flying flocks and they come to a tank and they're drinking and they're sort of flying around the tank while they're taking turns getting a drink they are calling constantly <laughs> doing that kiddly 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 kind of call a lot and that is very useful when you're doing a sound recorder study because the recorder will pick up on that and that means you can then take those many hundreds of hours of audio that you just collected from because i had um, sound recorders at multiple tanks and we'd kind of move them around throughout the winter and we were trying to figure out which tanks were their favorite and how frequently they were coming into those tanks which a sound recorder is great for especially if the bird's making a lot of noise on their own which long spurs do in the winter anyway and they're coming in in these noisy flocks and we could then take that data those many many hundreds of hours <laughs> of audio files and not listen to them as humans but run them through this software called Kaleidoscope that you train the software. Okay, this is the sound I'm looking for. You give it long spur sounds or whatever your target is. And then it goes through and tries to uh, identify them. Okay, I found audio files and this is sort of a results window here on the left. Say, so, okay, we found audio files that have that sound you're asking me for. And then you have to listen to it like, no, that's not right. And you tell it which ones are correct and which ones are not. And it, it refines the process and then it gets pretty good. And then you can actually go through those audio files. Once you have confidence in what it's telling you, the software, yes, these are the audio files. And we, this uh, spreadsheet on the right is showing how we could take those audio files and show that at this tank, this is John's tank, which is on the South end of Los Cienegas, that we had long spur flocks come in or a flock of long spurs. We got long spur sounds detected at 754, at 735, 731 on these different days. So it looks like on this day, they were coming in a lot. So this just gave us a good sense of they were coming to this tank frequently between 9 and 10 a.m. on these various days. And then on 128, they were coming in from 7 basically to 11. Then they were not there for two hours. And then they came in from 1 to 2 and then 2 to 3 p.m. So this was very helpful to us to try to figure out which tanks were their favorite was using these, these um wildlife acoustics ARUs they're known as automated recording units so that's been a really cool aspect of this project as well is how well sound recorders have worked so when we added transects and tanks to the mix so when we we tried to make our surveys a lot more repeatable and disciplined so we were these blue marks these blue water symbols are tanks that I had teams checking and watching for a set amount of time they're supposed to be at that tank for 45 minutes and watch it. And then these transects are 200 meter long transects where we had teams walking that exact line to record what birds they flushed up. So we're trying different things is, is my main point here. And um, I do also wanna show uh, some of our maps. So real quick here, I have all my little things lined up. Okay, so we do these results maps, which anyone can access. They're on our website, arizonaiba.org. And if you go there to survey resources and then down to the wintering grassland survey, and I'll put those links in the video description as well as in the follow-up email. These, this is a map showing, um, this is the Los Angeles. So we were trying new things. And I really want to thank all of our volunteers for being such good sports on this. Cause this winter in particular, cause I want to, I'm having, I have a scheduled conversation with Burke Conservancy of the Rockies to collaborate on discussing 
different approaches we've both been trying to try to monitor long spurs, chestnut color long spurs, since they are so difficult to survey for in the winter because they're very, very clumpy. They get in these big groups and they sort of move around and have their favorite spots and they're kind of difficult to capture on regular surveys. So we've been doing a mix of different things to try. So I did them as tank centric, which is our innovation. That is something I'm bringing to the Burr Conservancy of the Rockies as an idea where, so this is a, a well-known tank that the long spurs really like. This is in Las Cienegas. This is that area that um, is that what I've often referred to as Barrett Sparrow tank, but now on eBird is referred to as Smith Canyon tank, but it's sort of the, the Barrett Sparrow spot from many, many, many birders I know have trekked out here. But we, and we did have some, so we had 50 long spurs that came to this, this tank during the survey. We, estab I established transects that went straight out from the tank, 200 meters long. And then I did a series of point counts where people stood there for six minutes and recorded all the birds that they detected within six minutes while standing there. And this was, this is being done using Bird Conservancy of the Rockies existing protocols, which is why we're doing six minutes, which is why they're 200 meter long transects. I'm trying to collect data or have the, our teams collect data in a way that it can become a part of Burr Conservancy of the Rockies existing data set as like supplemental data. So we can contribute to this larger, you know, data collection effort that covers the whole region of Chihuahuan Desert Grassland internationally. So my emphasis is trying to make our data as useful as we can to this larger study so we can contribute to this overall assessment of uh, where the chestnut collars long spurs are wintering internationally. And it's been difficult because they're very tricky birds. BCR, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, has had a lot of trouble with this as well. So this is what we did in February, where we did point counts and then transects centered on tanks. Now, what's really cool about these maps is you can turn layers on and off. And what we've done um, before that was doing... Um, I also have all my results in here too. So I have layers you can turn on to see where we've had long spurs on various surveys. Those are little bird icons. But um, doing these survey routes has been what we did the last um, four years where we've done these transects that are all over the grasslands. And some of them are in spots that are randomly chosen. And some of them are spots that are areas we've had long spurs historically in the past because we do these same areas over and over again. So here's a good example. So I put one here, sort of randomly placed, one here, randomly placed, and then one right near a tank. So we've done these transects for several years, but adding the point counts and having the transects come west from the tanks was a new, a new thing we tried this winter. So it's definitely been tricky. Um, and we have results in these maps, and you can go to these maps and click around and see where we've had them in various years. And I always put the total. Um, you may notice that 2020 to 2021, the total was eight for Los Angeles, and it was about that for San Rafael too, because that was right on the heels, that was right in the midst of that terrible drought we had, where we had pretty much no monsoon in 2020, the non of 2020, and then very little winter rain after that, and then by the time spring came around of 2021, it was just absolutely crunchy dry everywhere in Southeast Arizona, and that really impacted how much food was available. So the grasses never got monsoon rain. There was very, very little seeding happening, very little food. So the long spurs just were not around in 2020 to 2021. But um, yeah, it's kind of neat. You can go through here and look at these layers, turn on, turn on and off different years. I have totals on these. So this is really kind of fun way you can come in and see what's going on. And um, I have been blogging all this in here and we're also going to be working on a report and oh i gotta i gotta finish my my talk with my final slide of uh, i want to thank our amazing volunteers and uh they've really for many years i have people that have helped with these surveys pretty much every year since the beginning i have a few people that have been with us doing these since 2011 and i really appreciate everyone's help with this and every year we get new people too new volunteers so if you're interested in this make sure you sign up for our iba sort of news um you know, e-blasts and watch out for those volunteer emails saying, um, you know, of uh, different volunteer opportunities. And another way you can help even just besides being a part of organized surveys is if you go out to these areas in the winter and you're birding, 
just having a little extra effort to listen and look for long spurs and then putting them into eBird in sort of a careful way. If you get long spurs, maybe start a new list so the, the location is very accurate. That's very helpful. I do look at eBird data every year for these birds and just putting what you find on eBird is an incredibly useful way that you can help um, help us look for and find long spurs. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and see if we have any questions because I have not watched the chat at all. Awesome, Jenny. Thank you so much. It was so interesting hearing about all your methodology and just how much you've been able to learn about the long spurs. Um, so I don't think there are any outstanding questions in the chat. Um, some people were putting in where they've gotten to see the birds, which is really cool. That's great. Um, but if anyone has a question that hasn't been answered at this point, you're welcome to unmute and ask it or throw it in the chat now. I have a question. Um, sure. Thank you so much. Ton of information, my goodness. Um, you mentioned the the way that they fly in flocks and move around. Is there any patterning to that? Is there any time of day where you're more likely to see a flock, you know, take off, or or is it, you know, kind of random from your point of view? I think the, it's definitely a little more likely in the morning, and then sort of in the late afternoon is when I tend to see them moving around. But you can kind of see them any time of day. Like many birds, I do think they kind of take a siesta. <laughs> in the middle of the day and they tend to do that on the ground if they're not actively flying around they tend to sit directly on the ground now in the early morning sometimes we'll see them on the fences like some of those videos and photos sometimes they're right on the fence because they're trying to warm up and sit in the sun but the rest of the day they're just down in the grass and i have had flocks of the longspurs land right in front of me and i can't see them i know they're there but they just disappear into the the sort of short grass it's unbelievable actually very snow bunting like and I have seen, I have detected them almost all parts of the day, I'd say. And, and from our, our um, sound recording data, they do tend to move around, at least coming into the tanks anyway, frequently throughout the morning, I'd say, you know, 7 a.m. to 11, and then quite a lot from, you know, 2 to sunset. So I think they take kind of a break right in the middle of the day where they're probably just sitting on the ground resting and digesting. But um they are pretty active throughout the day and hanging out at the tanks is a really good way to see them. But sometimes if you're just walking through grassland, if you happen to come through a good piece of habitat, they'll fly up because you've, you've frightened them. They'll fly up and they call, they do that same call. They call a lot. They move around as a group, that sort of popcorn flying pattern, which my background of me here, my, my video background is showing, this is also a photo taken in Los Angeles of a group. And you can see how some of them have their wings open, some of them have them closed, some of them partial closed all in the same moment. And that's the, the logistics of what's causing that, that motion of flying around each other because some are sort of falling while others are flying up uh, within a moment. Great, um, thank you. Oh, so someone asked what our total was from the February survey. Let's see here. I did share that with all of the surveyors, but let me, I have it right here. Uh, 2023. So for La Cienega, and I'm looking at that map. Let me share my screen real quick. So our question was, what was our total for uh, this winter's surveys? So for 2023, I have here, um, the numbers were kind of low this winter. And because a lot of it is they move around throughout the region. So if, if conditions are better, say in, in Mexico, more of them will go down to Mexico for the winter. But uh, so for our January survey in La Cienega, we had uh, close to 100. And then for the February survey, we only had two spots where we had long spurs in Los Cienegas, and it was 180 down in Davis pasture, which is that south of the highway section of Los Cienegas, and then 50 at the Baird Sparrow tank. So that's, you know, 230 that we had for the February survey in Los Cienegas, and then San Rafael, and I'll share these links too with uh, as a follow-up and put it in the video description as well. Um, go down to our results, which if you scroll down, you can see our results. I have the 2023 already up. So, and you can turn these on and off for your own, trying to see what's going on. Cause it gets, the map gets a little crowded of all the layers are on, but so for, um, 2023, looks like we had a little over a hundred in the January survey. Cause we always do two visits. And then the February survey, it was fewer than a hundred in San Rafael, but they were much more spread out and you can kind of see exactly where they were. We had some on the north end, we had some on the south end, some on the extreme south end, right on the US-Mexico border. 
and um this can be very helpful if you're a birder and you want to go see these birds on where to find them and they will be around for a little while longer if anyone wants to go see chestnut collar long furs and you're here right now they usually stick around to the end of february into maybe the first week or two of march now they can kind of go at any time the first few weeks of march so you might miss them if you wait till march but they should definitely be around through the end of february similar pattern to the sandhill cranes where they tend to be pretty reliably around to the end of february now early march we have seen big migration flocks starting to move through so you might get a big flock early march because they start to move north and some of the mexico birds occur in southeast arizona then as they start moving towards their breeding grounds far to the north all right see what other questions they hang on to mixed flocks with horn larks or laplands um i have seen long spurs hang out a little bit mixed with like thick bill long spurs sometimes um sometimes with horn lark too but i think that's more a feature of the horn larks and the the thick builds might be already at the tank when the long spurs show up but the longs those birds horn larks um and thick bill long spurs are so cute in on insects they eat a lot of insects in the winter and chestnut collar long spurs don't they eat a huge amount of insects on the breeding grounds during the breeding season but they don't eat very many insects in the winter as far as the few studies i could find of wintering long spurs have shown now a big issue here is that 99 percent of the studies of chestnut collar long spurs have happened on the breeding grounds but the few studies i could find from the winter where someone did do some sort of food studies on what was in the bellies of wintering chestnut collar long spurs found that um it was almost entirely seeds so i think they will mix like a little bit but when they fly off it tends to just be those chestnut collars they really like each other's company in the winter they hang out in a defensive you know, safety and numbers kind of group. And I have seen a mix in, but but mostly they seem to sort of stay with their own friends, their own chestnut collar long spur friends. Okay, was there any other questions, Kirsten, that jump out at you or if anyone would like to ask a question? I think you've got everything. Um, I do want to shout out to Jana and Greg for throwing in some great photos they've gotten of chestnut collar long spurs. It's always fun to see. That's great. Oh, here's um, a nice description too. I'd like to touch on before we end, but uh, oh yeah, someone put some beautiful photos there. Oh, how nice. Okay, so this question here from, or a, a note from Mac about this behavior. I have seen this as well. It's very interesting. I watch New Mexico, Mexico. They basically never stop flying except to drink for a second and then back up the popcorning around while tinking. This is something I've seen them do too. And it's so interesting to watch where when the flock comes in to drink, like to a tank, like those photos I show where you have a group at a tank. I've seen them do this too where they're flying as a group and you're like how did but they never seem to get a drink if you watch closely like max pointing out if you watch closely they seem to mostly be flying around popcorning but if you watch a small percentage of them will drop get a quick drink and then join back into that swirl of long spurs and i do think this is sort of a visual cover where they're mostly flying around but taking turns dropping to get a quick drink and then flying back up as a defensive mechanism against like a falcon or something it's like a, it's like a, a swirl of of backup cover protecting the ones below them that are getting a drink so that it would be very visually confusing for like a merlin to grab one of them so i really think that's a defensive mechanism and it's fascinating to watch and they call constantly they're communicating with each other constantly while they're doing it all right so that's so um, interesting. Long spur eats primarily insects. Yeah. So, and that's why you often find them at the tanks that have lots of cow pies around because those are going to be full of insects. And that's where I usually see the thick builds is those ones that have been visited by cattle quite a lot, those tanks. Um, tied to tanks, especially say center pivot. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's the thing I didn't touch on. And something I want to start next winter is looking for long spurs among those agricultural fields, which is a very different habitat type than the two IBAs we've been focusing on, is you do get them in the Sulphur Springs Valley around those agricultural fields, especially in the corners near the center pivots. So those all that agriculture near Wilcox, sometimes some winters you get quite a lot of long spurs down there. And we want to start figuring out a way to survey for that. It's tricky because it's a lot of private land, but we're going to work out on a strategy for that. All right. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Jenny. This is so cool and so comprehensive and I'm sure everyone learned a lot. Um, so yeah, another plug to those of you in the Tucson area, come out and volunteer for our bird surveys. They're a lot of fun. 
Um, and thank you for spending the last hour with us. We'll have the recording uh, up on our YouTube page today or tomorrow, and I'll send out that link uh, as well as um, some of these resources that Jenny has mentioned. Um, and we hope you'll come back and join us again for another event. So thank you so much. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.